So here in lecture 12.5, we're going to finish our analysis of the logic side, the gate level delay analysis side of static climbing analysis. And we're going to look at exactly how do I compute the ATs and the RATs and the slacks. In a realistic kind of a design, I've got a million gates or five million gates or 10 million gates. I need to be able to do one quick pass through this logic or a couple of quick passes through this logic and calculate everything. So we're going to show you um, a nice recursive sort of an algorithm which in a forward pass through the graph can label the arrival times, in a backward pass through the graph can label the required arrival times, can uh, then use the ATs and the RATs to calculate the slacks and get you immediately the worst path the most violating path if you have a timing problem. The next thing we're going to do, which is really maybe a little surprising and kind of cool, is that we're going to show you that the exact same idea from maze routing, the wavefront expansion, heap, cost-based cost expansion, can be used to actually report worst case paths, worst delay paths, in path order. So you know the sort of thing that happens in a real design is you've got 10 million gates, and you've got 30,000 paths that are violating your timing. What do you want to know? You want to know the worst one first. What do you want to know next? You want to know the second worst one, and then the third worst one, and then on and on to the 29,999th worst one. You want them in order. How do you find them in order? And the answer is an algorithm that looks exactly like cost-based maze routing. So let's go look at how you calculate the ATs, how you calculate the RATs, how you calculate the slacks, and how you report the paths, how you enumerate the paths worst in worst case order to finish up our discussion of logic side timing. So let's look for a second at what the, you know, the most typical kind of static timing analysis problem there is. So, uh, you know, you give me your logic, you tell me your clock period, so let's say it's a nanosecond, so you know, this is a gigahertz clock, and, and you ask me to answer this question, what are all the two slow paths, okay, that violate timing? And the most useful answer is that I report the paths in order from the slowest to the fastest. Right, so in other words, I'm enumerating those paths in, in delay order, so not only do I have to be able to tell you the worst path, I need to be able to tell you all the worst paths because it doesn't help, right, if you just tell me one of them, right? So, you know, um, in a big logic network with, you know, millions and millions of gates, you know, the first time you design it, the first time you synthesize it, the first time you optimize it, um, you know, I mean, you could have tens of thousands of paths that are in violation. And it's just as an interesting aside, uh, you remember when I talked about the fact that we assumed everything was statically sensitizable and that there are lots of false paths? Really, in the real world, um, it's often the case that the designers, the people who are putting the systems, uh, you know, specifications together, they actually know where a lot of the false paths are. So if you're actually to really look at a static timing analysis kind of input, uh, you know, you might actually have a list of 30,000 paths that you are telling the tool, don't find this, please, or if you find this, and I know you'll probably find this, don't report this to me, please, because honestly, I don't care, it's not a real path please move on and give me the next path. So, you know, that, that sort of happens. But you have millions of logic gates in your, you know, in your, in your network. You have tens of thousands of paths in violation. The most useful thing to do is to report them to me in the order of worst to least violating. So, that's the other thing we need to keep in mind is how to enumerate the problems. So, what do we need? We need to calculate all the arrival times, the ATs. We need to calculate all the required arrival times, the RATs. We need to calculate all the slacks. And we need to do this very efficiently because these graphs are, are gigantic. They're really enormous. Um, and we also have to figure out how to enumerate the violating paths in worst delay order. Okay? So this is what we want to figure out how to do. So this is actually all sort of interesting that the delay graph and a little bit of more sort of mechanics on this graph will actually let us do all of this stuff. So, one approach, this is an easy approach, I like this approach because it's easy to explain, um, is that we do topological sorting on the delay graph. And so the way to think about this is that um, I'm only going to do one recursive thing on the graph, which is I'm going to sort it into the nodes into a special order. And then pretty much all the processing, the actual calculation stuff I'm going to do on the graph, is really not going to be recursive. It's just going to be sort of manipulating the nodes. 
So um, a topological sort sorts the vertices in the delay graph into one single ordered list with the essential property that if there's an edge from a node P to a node S, P has to appear before S in the sorted order. So I've got a little graph example here. There's a source node, and then there's nodes B and C, D and E in sync. So the source has an edge of 3 to B and an edge of 4 to C. B connects to D with a 5 and E with an 11. C connects to E with a 9. D connects to sync with a 6. E connects to sync with a 15. A topological sort is a list of the nodes source, B, C, D, E, sync in the order so that if there's an edge from one node to the next, that node appears before the next. So for example, B has an edge that goes to D. So B has to appear before D in the order. And D has an edge that goes to the sink. So D has to appear before the sink in the order. And a topological sort is just a very simple algorithm that comes up with this order. So for example, source B, D, C, E, sink is a, is a legitimate order. Source B, C, D, E, sink is a legitimate topological sort order. Source B, C, E, D, sync. Source C, B, D, E, sync. Source C, B, E, D, sync. Those are all legitimate topological sorting orders. And this is a really simple algorithm. If you go type topological sort in, Wikipedia comes back immediately and says, oh, this is a, you know, a famous thing. And Wikipedia even comes back with a little bit of pseudocode. And you know, honestly, this is nothing more than a depth first search walk on the graph with a little bit of processing. So this is a very, very, very easy thing to do. So let's assume that you've actually topologically sorted the graph. Right? How do you compute the arrival time? So I've got my little picture again from the previous couple of lectures ago of computing the arrival time. So there's a source node. There's a set of highlighted nodes called the predecessors, pred n of node n. One of them is distinguished with a p. Right? And they all have a delay delta from, say, node p to node n. And then there's the remaining side of the graph. So there are the successor nodes to node n, which one of them is highlighted with an s. And the successor nodes all have paths to the sink, but those are all in gray. What I really care about is node n and its predecessors, the predecessors of n. Right? So if I have topologically sorted the graph, there's a very simple algorithm. You just walk through the list. Right? So to compute the ats, the first thing you do is you set the at of the source to 0, because that's what it is. And then for each node n in topologically sorted order, the first thing you do is you set the at to negative infinity, because you're calculating a max, and you just need the first one to you know, never be the right answer. And then for each node in the predecessors, right? so you look at all the nodes in the predecessor set of node n, you just calculate. You know, the at is the max over. Um, the at of node n, you know, this is the running maximum, and the at of the predecessor node p plus the, uh, plus the, uh, the delay from node p to n. Um, you just simply walk through the node sort of from the source to the sink, knowing that you're visiting the nodes in an order such that every time you get to a node like n, you know you've already processed the arrival times of all of its predecessors, and you can just calculate it straightforwardly. So this is pretty close to the definition from the at we gave you know, 20 slides earlier. This is really simple. This is why we like the topological sorting. It makes this really simple. How do you calculate the rats? Well, you know, more or less the same thing. But you, know, you sort of pretend that you're going in the opposite direction. So it's kind of like you're pretending all the edges are reversed, that they point from the sink to the source. So you're, you know, you're just going to walk the graph backwards, which means you walk the topological sorting order in the other order. So how do you calculate the rats? Um, again, assuming you have a topological sorting, you set the rat of the sink to be the cycle time, because that's the right answer. And then for each node n in reverse topological sorted order, okay, um, you uh, walk backwards through the graph. Um, and then you look at, uh, in this case, you look at all the successors, right? So you look at node n. You look at all the successor nodes, which you know have been visited already because you've got the topological sorting order correct. You look at each successor node S, and you calculate the rat with the formula. The rat is the minimum of whatever the rat is, because you know, you're starting, uh, this is the running rat computation, or the rat of S, the successor minus the edge delay, delta from N to S. So 
All pretty simple, all pretty straightforward. If you can topologically sort the graph, and you can do that with a very simple depth first search, then you get this list with you know several million nodes in it. You just walk it straight in order, and you know that every time you visit a node in the forward order for the at, you've already calculated the predecessor, so you can just use the formula. And you know that when you walk the list in the reverse order, you've already calculated the rat for the successor, and you can just use the formula. It's beautiful and simple and easy. Now, um, another thing that's really not at all obvious and is kind of cool is that you can use the slack for path reporting. Right? So remember one of the things I said was I really want to enumerate the paths in worst delay order because then I can actually go ask a question like, what are all the paths with a delay greater than 12? Right? In order, I can focus on sort of the biggest problems first. You can use the slack for path reporting. The slack property is that all the nodes on the longest path have the same slack. Right? So the surprising result is you can actually use this to find the n worst paths, even though you didn't trace them all. You can actually enumerate them one at a time in order with a really easy algorithm. So let's just actually sort of put all the values on this little graph. So this is the same graph I showed previously. Source, B, C, D, E, sync. Um, source connects with a 3 to B, 4 to C, B goes to D with a 5, B goes to E with an 11, C goes to D, C goes to E with a 9, D goes to sync with a 6, E goes to sync with a, with a 15. The cycle time is 29, just made it up. The ats are, the at for the source is 0, the at for B is 3, the at for 8 is D, the at for D is 8, the at for C is 4, the at for E is 14, and the sync, the at is 29. What about the rats? I'm going to do this backwards. The rat for the sink is 29. The rat for D is 23. The rat for E is 14. The rat for B is 3. The rat for C is 5. The rat for source is 0. And what are the slacks? The slack is 0 at the source, 0 for B, 1 for C, 15 for D, 0 for E, 0 for the sink. Right? So, we can do a forward pass to get the ats, a backward pass to get the rats. While we're doing the rats, we can also do the slack. So one forward pass to the graph, one backward pass to the graph, all the ats, all the rats, all the slacks. Now, there's a surprising and simple algorithm for actually doing the n worst path reporting. And what's really amazing is that it's basically maze routing. And one of the reasons for talking about the maze routing stuff first um, is that uh, you get the, sort of the conceptual framework, and I can do this in one slide. Right? So, we're going to find the n-worst paths by evolving partial paths, just like we evolve partial paths in the maze router. And each partial path stores three things. The path itself, the delay on this path, and the slack of the final node on the path. And we're going to store the partial paths in a heap, just like maze routing. Only the thing that we're going to use to index the heap is the slack value. Right, so in maze routing, we were indexing on either the length, you know, the path length, or the estimated path length if we had a predictor. We're just going to do this on the slack. So we're going to sort so that the path with the worst slack endpoint is always on the top. That means, you know, we're going to have the heap always make sure that the partial path with the most smallest slack, and that might even mean the slack with the biggest negative, the most negative number is on the top. And initially, the heap just contains the source node, just like two-point maze routing. And then the algorithm, the rest of the algorithm looks you know, really very, very simple and familiar like maze routing. There's an expansion step. You pop the partial path off the top of the heap. It has the most negative smallest slack, or at least the smallest slack. Um, you ask the question, have I reached the target? Is the end node the sink? If so, correct. Congratulations. Print out the path and throw the node away. Otherwise, when you expand the path, which means you pull it out of the heap, you reach all of the other things that are one edge away. So you add each successor node to make new partial paths for all of the ed nodes that are connected by an edge, and you push them back on the heap with a little data structure that is the path, the delay, and the slack value of, the, of that new node, the node at the end of the partial path. And then you just keep going. Really, it is really just that simple. Um, let's do a little simple example. So I've got my little graph again, source, B, C, D, E, sync, and I've got all the slack values labeled. Slack is 0 for the source, 0 for B, 1 for C, 15 for D, 0 for E, and 0 for the sync. And the heap starts 
as, if you will, the source cell, just like the source cell for a maze router. Um, and it starts um, with the source cell, the delay to the source cell, which in this case is zero, and the slack at the source cell, which is zero. And so we're just going to push that thing in the heap. It's really very much like maze routing. And I've got this highlighted um, in the graph. And we're going to see the highlights as these little green boxes that are going to be trying to show the, show the paths. So this is a path with exactly one cell in it, which is the source. Right? The delay on this path is zero because it's the source, and the slack on this uh, path is zero. And what we're going to do is we're going to evolve paths, so we're going to actually use this, you know, just like maze routing, we're going to be reaching our neighbors, and you know, you shouldn't be surprised that we're going to be reaching B and reaching C in the next slide. We're going to be calculating some stuff, we're going to be calculating some partial paths, we're going to be shoving things back in the heap. The heap is going to be driving this stuff. We pop things off the heap, we use this to sort of expand to find, to find new paths, and we throw the cell away. So. Right now, it's just like maze routing. There's one cell in the heap. It's the source. The delay is zero. The slack is zero. And let's remember that what we, what we do to sort of make this process go forward is we index on the slack. OK, so what happens next? Well, we take the source path, and we pop it off of the heap. And we use that to reach B and C. And so we actually get two new paths, right? We get the source to B path and we get the source to C path. And the source to B path has a length of 3, and the source to C path has a length of 4. But we put them indexed in the heap on the slack. And so it is the 0 slack of the B node, which is the end of the source to B path. That's the minimum of the heap. That's the thing that's the top of the heap. So there's two paths in the heap right now, source to B, source to C. But the thing that's on the top of the heap is the zero slack path source to be. So what are we going to do? We're going to take that path off. We're going to pop it. We're going to expand it. And we're going to use it to reach its neighbors. OK, so going forward, we are expanding the source to be path. And we're going to use that to reach its neighbors. So what are we going to get? We're going to reach D. And so we're going to get a source to B to D path. And then we're going to also reach E. So we're going to get a source to B to E path. And so I'm still highlighting these things with sort of green so you can get some sense. Those are the source to B to D path. And the slack value on the end of that one is 15. There's a source to B to E path. And the slack value on that one is 0. And there's a source to C path. And the slack value on that is 1. And so when you put those paths in the heap, source to B to E, source to B to D, source to C, Again, indexed on the slack value. So what's on the top? The source to B to E path, because it has the smallest slack. OK, so what are we going to do? We're going to take the thing off the top of the heap, the source to B to E path. We're going to pop it. We're going to expand it. That's the thing we're going to do next. All right, so going forward, the source to B to E path is being expanded. We've popped it out of the heap. And we're going to reach what? We're going to reach its neighbor, which is the sink. And so we get a source to B to E to sync path. Oh, hey, the sync is like the target in maze routing. Hooray! Only I've, I haven't routed a wire. I have found a path. I print it out. I print out source B, E, sync with the delay. That delay is 29. And then I throw that away. And I go back and I look at, OK, what's the next most, um, the next smallest slack path in the heap? And the answer is, it's the source to C path. right? It's this path, the source to C path. So I'm going to pop that off the heap, and I'm going to expand it, just like maze routing. I'm going to use it to reach its neighbors. Right? So that's going to happen next. What happens? I'm expanding the source to C path, and I reach E. Now, one of the things to note is that um, in this particular algorithm, um, I'm going to reach E again. So there's none of this, you know, a bit that you mark that says, oh, I've reached it, and I don't need to reach it again, you know, in sort of the maze routing with a consistent path, with a consistent cost function. Look, we're looking for longest delay paths in the graph. Um, we don't care if a bunch of them go through the same gate. In fact, you know, a bunch of them might go through the same gate. That's just the, that's just the way it works. So we pop the source to C path, and we expand it. What do we expand it to? We expand it to E. OK? And so we take it, and we push it back in. What do we push it back in on? We push it back in on the slack value. Right? The slack value is a 0. So we get a source to C to E path. 
with a slack value of zero. What else is sitting around in the heap? What else is sitting around in the heap is a source to B to D path with a slack of 15. Okay, what do we do? Go back to the heap, pop the smallest cell off the top. Smallest cell, the cell with the, you know, the worst slack value, the slack is a zero. We pop the source CE path and we expand it. So, pop the source CE path, um, and what happens? We expand it. When we expand it, we reach the sink. Oh, hey, it's like routing the net again. We have a source to C to E to sink path. Um, that's like reaching the target. We print the delay out. What's the delay on this one? The delay on this one is 28, and then we throw it away, just like you expand a cell and you throw it away in the maze routing. Okay, then we go back, and what's still sitting around in the heap? And the answer is, what's sitting around in the heap is a source to B to D path. And that has a slack of 15. It turns out that's the only thing in the heap right now. So we are going to expand that. We're going to pop it off the heap, and we're going to expand it and see what happens. So we expand it, and we're going to pop the source BD path, and we're going to reach the sink again. Hooray! Okay, what happens? Now we reach the sink with a path delay of 14. Great. We print out the source BD sync path of 14, and we go back and we say, all right, what else is in the heap? And the answer is, oh, nothing. The heap is empty. Well, in this particular case, like, oh, okay, we've printed all the paths for this particular graph, which if you look at it, makes sense. There's only three ways you can get from the source to the sync in this graph. Look at it. Source BD sync, source BE sync, source CE sync. And look, my little maze routing kind of algorithm where I evolve a partial path, I index it by the slack on the end node of the partial path, I push it into the heap like reaching things, I pop it out and expand it just like maze routing, um, I acknowledge the fact that I will reach the same node multiple times, I don't worry about it for this particular algorithm, I can print out for you all of the paths in the worst delay order. And believe me, when you have millions and millions of gates and, you know, zillions of paths, and you know that, you know, probably the first 35,000 paths are screwed up, right, because, you know, your timing's not optimized yet and you just want to print them out in the order of worst to least worst, the fact that you can do this super fast is wonderful, right? It's a beautiful, simple algorithm. And it's one of the reasons why I talk about maze routing before I talk about this stuff, because it really feels just like maze routing. So, um, with that, uh, you know, we basically we come to the end of our, of our static timing analysis. Static timing analysis is a very important step in the design of complex ASICs. It's what's called a sign-off step. And what that means is that you don't get to fabricate or you don't get to go to the next step of the design process until you pass this. So people spend a lot of time qualifying their design, optimizing their design, changing their design, fixing their design so that it passes the static timing analysis sign-off. You can do it early in the process when you just have the logic gates and you know, either you know nothing about the wires or really lousy models for the wires. The more information you have about your gates, the more information you have about your wires, the more accurate your uh, static timing analysis can be. Many big ideas, you know, to get to this point in our lecture, gate level delay models matter, and I'm sorry to say they can just be really complex in the real world. It's just the way the physics work. Logical analysis of the graph is not what we're doing. We're doing topological path analysis. We're assuming all paths are sensitizable, no paths are false. Honestly, in real static timing, somebody who's really smart and knows a lot about the logic will tell you that there are just some false paths, and they'll put them in the file, and they'll say, please don't report these. We both know they're false. You build a delay graph, you calculate the ats, the rats, and the slacks recursively. Um, I gave you a really simple algorithm where you topologically sort the graph um, from the source to the sink. You walk from the source to the sink, you calculate the ats. You walk from the sink to the source, you calculate the rats and the slacks. And then you can do this cool path reporting stuff. The concept of slack is very, very big. Um, it's, you know, it's, it's an incredibly, incredibly important idea because it drives the path enumeration process and because it tells you how much trouble you're in on a gate-by-gate -gate basis in a gigantic network. Right? So it lets you locate the worst paths in the problem gates. And an idea surprisingly like maze routing lets you enumerate the paths in worst delay order, which is really a very, very pretty algorithm. 
Finally, um, the static timing um, world is so big, and the world of timing is so complicated. I have to admit, uh, but just you know, uh, a few of the things I didn't tell you. Um, I didn't tell you anything about static timing analysis with sequential elements. Um, I pretended the flip flops didn't exist, and that's not really good enough. Um, how do you model the flip flops or latches so you can verify, for example, that the setup and the hold time um, are not being violated? Um, you know, for a design that has a million flip flops in it. Um, it turns out there's just some more tricks with the delay graph. Um, it's very interesting. You can take the delay graph and you add some edges to it that represent the timing things. It turns out you add some loops to the graph, which is a little disconcerting, but it turns out you add some loops to the graph, you calculate some ats and some rats and things, um, and then you check the values on some edges and sort of like the slacks, if something bad happens to the number, you know you have a problem. Um, there's a whole other kind of analysis that I didn't show you. What I showed you is technically called late mode timing analysis. So it is, I worry about the longest path through the graph. I worry about the fact that my clock is a gigahertz. I have one nanosecond, 1,000 picoseconds to get you know, from the input of the logic to the output of the logic, and that's what we worried about. Um, there's early mode timing if you have things like transparent latches. Um, where you're worried about the shortest paths and you know maybe you know going around the loop from the storage element through the logic more than once in one clock period. There's some fancy kinds of timing that use these sorts of sophisticated analysis. There's a whole other set of formulas. They look very much like the late mode, but they're just a little harder to understand if you're not working with some of the more fancy timing uh, problems. There's also incremental static timing analysis. So, you know, in practice, you have a million logic gates and you change 10,000 of them because some logic designer fixes something. You really don't want to redo the whole static timing analysis. You just want to go in and change the stuff that changes. Um, there's some very, very nice algorithms that can just incrementally look at um, what changed in your logic and so what's going to change in your static timing analysis. You know, what are the, the, the ats that can change? What are the rats that can change? What are, this, what, are the, what are the slacks that can change? Don't update all 20 million of them if you only have to update 500,000 of them. Um, so there are very pretty algorithms that do that and again, just didn't have time to talk about it. Static timing analysis is a huge, huge part of the way people actually build, build chips. And so you now know the logic side of things. What we need to talk about next is the geometry side because you know what? You know what's between all those gates? Wires. And wires have their own complicated timing behavior. So let's go look at those next.